every sinful stain. I've been born again, and I proclaim you are Lord and King of everything to give you praise. It's why I sing no other name. It's my your name. Yesterday, today, and forever the same. And you deserve the highest praise. You conquered death and rose from the grave. Jesus, you are great. You are Lord and King of everything to give you praise. It's why I sing no other name. It's my your name. Yesterday, today, and forever the same. And you deserve the highest praise. You conquered death and rose from the grave. Jesus, you are great. Oh, I marvel at the miracles I've read about. How you healed the man with the withered hand. Open blinded eyes of man. My soul from every sinful state. Everybody. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Blessing to be here on this morning, isn't it? Um, all right, let's go into prayer together first, and then we'll have our penny march. But let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessings on this service. 
Precious Heavenly Father, we're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you so much for your presence, your anointing, and your help, God. We need you continually. We ask, Lord, for your touch on this service, Lord, every part of the service, Lord. We give it into your hand, Lord. We can't do anything without you, Lord. We just call on you, Lord. We need you today, Jesus. Touch every heart, every life, those in the sanctuary, those watching online, Lord, that you touch them. Send healing and help, Lord. We ask for salvation today, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Lord. Send healing, Lord Jesus, strength. Lord, we love you and we praise you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in this service, Lord. Let your word go forth without hindrance today, God, throughout the Sunday school, Lord, throughout the preaching, Lord, the praying, Lord, the singing, God, the offering, Jesus. We just ask you to bless every part, Lord, and we be careful to give you the glory, praise, and honor for all that's done. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we ask. In the name of Jesus, we believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. We'll ask our ushers to come. Ushers to come and do our penny march. We appreciate this. Then they'll come back around and do our uh, Sunday school offering right after that. Praise the Lord. this morning for Sunday school uh, to the book of Habakkuk um, in the Old Testament, please. A lot to say, a little time to say it, so we'll go as quickly as we can. Habakkuk, uh, there's only three chapters. We'll be in chapter three. Give you a minute to find it. And as you're looking, we'll go ahead and get started just because, again, I have a lot to say. We'll try to get it all out with the Lord's help. Um, Habakkuk chapter 3. Have you ever been driving your car down the road, maybe on a familiar everyday routine route or maybe on an out-of-town trip that you do occasionally to eat out or visit friends or family or even driving your car in a totally new area uh, on a trip or an outing that takes you on roads you have never traveled Have you ever been driving your car in any one of those scenarios and you come up on a dreaded black and orange, yellowish sign, I guess it's orange, the one that you don't have to be able to actually read a good distance back because of the coloring, it gives it away completely. And as you approach, the familiar letters scream their dreaded purpose for your life and the altering of the course you have planned to take, the sign reads, detour. Ever been there? driving along and all of a sudden there's a detour sign. Seeing that sign doesn't typically mean joy and happiness, but rather confusion and more often than not a longer travel time. Detour by definition means a long or roundabout route route that is taken to avoid something or to visit somewhere along the way. Maybe because of road construction, maybe because of road damage, maintenance, or perhaps even a wreck, 
A detour reroutes traffic to bypass whatever is in the re regular path and gives an alternate path that keeps them moving toward their destinations rather than coming to a stop altogether or being instructed to turn around altogether. A detour means someone in authority has taken the time and used the appropriate understanding and knowledge to provide a path that doesn't harm the one traveling but rather keeps them moving not altering again the destination, but modifying the course to get them there, a detour. With the exception of maybe the younger drivers in the room, most of us have encountered such signs. We've all been driving along, minding our own business, going about our everyday lives when a detour sign has changed our course. An unexpected detour sign took us down and over roads we did not expect to travel and most likely had no idea they even existed in some cases. I had to do a detour here a while back in Archdale. Had no idea what roads I was on. I was just following those signs, but there was a wreck and I had to take that detour and I had no idea what those roads were. I couldn't take you back on them today, but that's what happens sometimes. And we're all familiar with having to do this in the natural, but I'd like you to consider this. Detour signs also mark our spiritual journeys as well. Detour signs that pop up out of nowhere, changing our plans and our course. Detour signs that direct our next move to be not by choice, but by design. From the one who sees and understands it all. Aren't you thankful? Couldn't help but think about some of those of you who have lost loved ones recently or even years ago. Your day was going about as normal. You're driving along, so to speak, until the detour sign showed up. Again, not by choice but by design. You were thrust on a path of grief and heartache. You found yourself on roads you never knew existed, roads you hadn't planned to travel on, uh, that didn't even on your map exist in GPS until you were there. There are other detours in our lives. What about job changes or a friendship or relationship change, young people? What about um, an unexpected financial burden comes along, a sickness or an illness causes you to travel paths you did not and would not have chosen, let alone desired to be on, but detour signs led you directly to them. The Bible itself holds many examples of detours in the lives of those who fill its pages. Here are just a few. One of the longest detours of all time happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness. What should have taken them 11 days to enter the promised land turned into a 40 year detour in the desert. That detour was due to their deplorable lack of faith in God's conquering power. Moses was detoured into submission. Those 40 years in the wilderness, tending sheep were not a waste, but actually a training ground for tending Israel later on. The desert experience took all the trust in the arm of the flesh out of Moses. Joseph was de detoured from dad's favor to Potiphar's labor overnight, and then once again with the tricks of Potiphar's wife, he had, you know, was seeing the world through prison bars, and the forgetfulness of a, of a butler sent another detour. He had many of those along the way. Philip was detoured from many to one. He went from winning multitudes to winning one man, the Ethiopian eunuch, from a great revival to a singular witnessing experience. Enoch and Elijah were detoured into heaven. Praise the Lord. Mary and Martha were detoured into making fun funeral plans at the death of their brother Lazarus in John 11 when they had planned to witness his healing. The list continues. David took a detour with the visit of a prophet, and Elijah also saw a detour sign in the form of a death threat. Detours, the unplanned rerouting of our course, frustrating and often time-consuming places that remind us we don't call the shots and we don't design the course. But let's get to the heart of this lesson. Remember the definition I read to you just a few moments ago, the definition of detour. Let's reread it again. Detour by definition means a long or roundabout route that is taken to avoid something or to visit somewhere along the way. I know you will agree that God directs our paths to include detours along the way, detours not by our choosing but by design, but let's take another look at the last portion of that, de of that definition. A detour can be taken to visit somewhere along the way. We established earlier that we all most likely have been on the receiving end of an unwanted, unexpected, literal detour sign, forced to go down roads that we didn't choose, not robbed of our destination, but instructed and guided to get there by other means. But how many of you have ever decided to take a detour on your own? 
Have you ever, while traveling, maybe on vacation or just on a whim, said, you know what, I think we should go see where this road leads. I want to see what's down there. Has anybody ever done that? I see, you see something you want to go see? Yeah. Maybe you were driving along, realized you just passed the home of a friend you hadn't seen in a long time. You decide today, going to stop and see them. Detours by choice. The idea to do something and to go somewhere completely unplanned in order to enjoy a view or take a picture, see a friend, or just discover a new route on your own. I can remember when I worked in Asheboro, all those back roads in Asheboro. I didn't live in Asheboro. You know, I always lived in the country. So I decided to conquer those things on my own, and I just drove them until I figured them out. <laughs> I may have to figure them all out, but when I worked there, I'm like, I'm going to figure all these roads out, and I just did. Uh, now, let's stop for a full disclosure at this point. I'm not talking about taking anything other than the old paths, okay? <laughs> I'm not embracing or trying to de detour us away from doctrine, and certainly there are those of that sort, but I aim to please him, don't you, and him alone. Stay true to his word, stand on his truth. I'm talking about spiritual detours chosen for us and those chosen by us in a true biblical sense. Let me get more to the point. This lesson was born out of a detour of sorts. I was reading my Bible one day looking for a certain story and was flipping to it, like flipping through the pages, when a scripture caught my eye. And I'm not one to just open my Bible and say, whatever, you know, open on it. And sometimes that works, but <laughs> I'm not one to do that. But I was looking for a particular story and was flipping to it when my Bible fell to Habakkuk 3. And I began to read, and I had highlighted this particular verse, and it just spoke to me. You know how the Bible does that. It just speaks to you in that moment, and there you are. And so I was, it took me on a detour. So that from that birthed this lesson about detours. I would like to ask you to go on a spiritual detour with me today. I would like to compel you to make a choice to travel a different road of thought and routine I want you to leave whatever road you are traveling in your life right now, be it a road of grief and sorrow or a path of frustration over your job, your marriage, your finances, your health. I'm inviting you to turn your car around, so to speak, from the road that typically takes you to stress and worry, anxiety, depression, anxiousness, and doubt, and go with me on a detour for the next few minutes. And I'm going to step a go a step further and not just ask or compel you to join me, but I'm going to give you permission. Sometimes we just need permission. Hey, let's just do this together. In essence, giving you the opportunity to leave your troubles behind. Isn't that nice? I'm giving you permission for the next few minutes. Leave them behind. Forget about them. Leave the road of guilt. Leave, leave the road of grief. Leave the road of financial worry. Leave the place of anxiety and sickness for the next few moments because it is not only possible, it is scriptural. It is scriptural to do that. Why? Because Habakkuk did the same thing. A minor prophet of the Old Testament was in a tough place. In his three-chapter-long book, found just after the book of Nahum, Habakkuk illustrates the ease with which one who loves the Lord and serves him can detour off the hard roads, the troublesome paths, and find themselves in a place of praise and adoration at the speed of a few brainwaves and the refoc refocusing of spiritual eyes. Habakkuk took a spiritual detour without leaving the desk he was most likely sitting at. And unlike the, pro the prophet Jeremiah, who was living and ministering at the same time as Habakkuk, both of these men were ministers at the same time. The, the major prophet Jeremiah and Habakkuk, Habakkuk's target audience for his message was much different than Jeremiah's. Backslidden Judah was fast approaching the judgment of God. Over the course of 19 years, the capital city of Jerusalem had been invaded three different times. And we know the third was the final time when it was ultimately destroyed. It was destroyed at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Habakkuk lived through most or all of this time of Judah's judgment. And we know this judgment was brought about because of the sin the backsliding, the idolatry of God's chosen people. In short, Habakkuk lived during some really hard times. He lived some very, very difficult situations. Habakkuk aimed to minister to the godly remnant of people who remained as each invasion of their beautiful city took place. Uh, each invasion, remember there were three. Uh, one of those invasions would have taken uh, Dave, uh, Daniel. 
and three Hebrew boys. One of those would have taken Ezekiel away. So there's these invasions that took uh, these men of God away, but Habakkuk remained. And in his short his writings, three short chapters, shows how he wrestles with God's decision. God used the most wicked people, the most powerful nation of that time, the most wicked of that day, to judge his own people. Habakkuk has a front row, front row seat to the plundering, the looting, and the carrying away of all that had once been good. That beautiful temple that we have read and studied about many times over, it was torn down and desecrated. Habakkuk was a witness to this uh, necessary yet very heartbreaking judgment of God. And it is in his final three verses of chapter 3 that we can witness Habakkuk make a choice, a conscious choice to take a detour from the devastation he was witnessing. He came to a place in the road where he made an effort to go another route. Let's read it together. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Although the fig trees shall not blossom, he's talking about the devastation of this land, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. To the chief, he's writing this, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Now I'm going to read you uh, that 19th verse in the Amplified Bible, and this is what, this is what really caught my attention uh, on my detour when I was reading. The Amplified version of verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength, my personal bravery, and my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, or responsibility. Amen? Isn't that awesome? It's as if we can witness Habakkuk change lanes, make a U-turn, whatever you want to call it, just as verse 18 begins at the word yet. He has already made a choice to take a detour, despite all he has been witness to, despite the roads he had traveled on to get him to that particular setting of that time, no matter the weariness of the load he carried and the hurt he felt. In the words of Sister Shelton, he made a choice to leave all this behind, slip up his hands, throw his heads back, and say, praise the Lord. Anyway, right? Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Habakkuk was no stranger to pain, to loss, to hurt. He was believed to be a Levite and a temple prophet. So he knew that temple well. Therefore, he had a front row seat to the apostasy of the people of God and the judgment of God that followed. Yet, Habakkuk made a conscious choice to not get overwhelmed by the overwhelming. He purposely and successfully lifted God up and honored God in the midst of the lowest place he could have possibly been. Do you think that's something you can do? It is something you have done before. I actually already know the answer to these questions, and God does too. There have been numerous times, could I count them, that I have made a conscious choice to leave the path I was on that was taking me down self-pity, that was leading me to fear and worry, that was on steady course of grief and anxiety and step over into a place of praise and worship. It is a spiritual thing to do this. Amen? It is born out of a heart of love for God and for his word and for his sovereignty. I sure don't know about this situation, much like Habakkuk. I don't know about the situation in my life, but I know the God of the situation won't let me down. So why not take a conscious or make a conscious design effort, decision to go ahead and praise him? Amen. Uh, there are great benefits, great benefits to taking such a detour Remember, some are chosen for us, but some detours we choose ourselves. What did Habakkuk find, find out while on his detour? What was the scenery like? Once Habakkuk said, yet, what happened next? The first thing he found out once he turned his head away from the sorrow 
and the pain in the natural was a simple and powerful truth. God is my strength. Amen. Psalm 27 and 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 28, 7, uh, 7 through 9 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart re greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength and he is the saving strength of his anointed. I love this in Isaiah 26 and 4 says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. That's something you can rely on, right? Psalm 18 and 1 says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Yes. Exodus 15, Moses, the Lord is my strength and my song. When the world is falling around, uh, falling apart around you, ever been there? When the, when the road God has chosen for you seems to be closing in and overwhelming you, remember this. Just like Habakkuk, God is your strength. Uh, you can even say it out loud if you would like. God is my strength. You can declare just like Moses, David, Isaiah, and Paul that it isn't you who is facing what you are facing, traveling the road you are traveling. It is Christ in you that is pressing on. Because if you serve him and you love him, you cannot and will not fail to be, uh, have all of his strength in your life and the power that you need to stand. Habakkuk's declaration of God being his strength is magnified for our understanding in the Amplified Bible when it goes on to say he is my personal bravery. He was Habakkuk's personal bravery as he looked out his back door, his front door, his windows as well and saw the literal tearing down of the city that once belonged to God, where people once served God, uh, when, opposing strong, opposing, when opposing strong opposing forces were running their streets and commanding their people to leave with them, it was time for strength for, for God, and it was time to have some personal bravery. Couldn't we all use a little more of this? Personal bravery. Couldn't we all use a little bit more boldness to stand up to the world, the flesh, and the devil? Isn't it comforting to know that it isn't me that has to be brave, but it's him in me that gives me this right and privilege to stand up and speak out for Christ? 2 Timothy 1 and 7, uh, very familiar, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I'm reminded of Esther in the king's court. A lot was riding on her choices and her boldness in standing up for God's people. I'm reminded of Shammah in that patch of lentils, defending the livelihood and the lifeline of God's people all by himself. He carried a lot of responsibility in doing that, didn't he? What about Elijah on Mount Carmel or David facing Goliath? God was their personal bravery, and he is ours as well. What are we supposed to be doing boldly for Christ right now where we are in our own lives? What should we do personally for him? When the world around Habakkuk was falling apart and fear was threatening to overwhelm, something stirred within him and reminded him he could stand up for God, stand up and be used by God, and it must have worked, right? Because we're talking about him today. Amen? Invincible. The next thing he talked about, that strength went beyond being something internal, a personal bravery, but it extended outside of himself. When the Amplified Bible says he was his invincible army. Invincible means too powerful to be defeated or overcome. I love what the Amplified Bible says of Psalm 91 and 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will remain secure and rest in the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no enemy can withstand. Amen. Did you know that the Taliban cannot defeat our God? Did you know that any and all nuclear attacks cannot move Jesus Christ? Did you know a Senate and a House full and running over with Democrats can't pass enough laws and spread enough lies and rebellion to even bruise the tip of God's finger? Praise the Lord. There's no God like Jehovah. Elijah and his servants found this to be true in 2 Kings 19, one of my absolute favorite stories. That Syrian king was angry with Elisha for giving away his position continually, so he sent his army to find him. And in 2 Kings 6, 14 through 16, he found him. 
and that Syrian army uh, surpassed them or, or compassed them about. But they soon found out they were not facing Elisha by himself. Uh, 2 Kings, let me read it, 6, 14 through 16. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. God sent a host and took the fight out of Esau as he was coming to fight Jacob in Genesis 20, 33. God sent a host to empower Joshua and the people of Israel as they were facing Jericho in Joshua 5. And the list goes on, and the host is still at the ready. Amen? What people uh, who can come against you do not realize is that when they come against you, they are coming against your God. Aren't you glad he will rend the heavens for you? Aren't you glad he stands at the ready to fight for you? It's okay to pray such prayers as, as found in Psalm 35 and 1. Plead my cause, o, o Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. I've prayed that many times. We serve a God who fights for us, who wins for us. Habakkuk had an understanding of not just God's power, but God's willingness to use his power to protect him as he faced this trying time. What a great reminder that we serve the same God who is our personal bravery and our invincible army. I believe we can all say with confidence we have nothing to worry about. Aren't you glad for this detour this morning? You have nothing to worry about. Praise the Lord. We're on this detour with him. Isn't he amazing? Praise the Lord. A couple more things real quickly. It's, my time's up, but... He, make, he makes my feet like hind's feet. That's the, the next thing that he said. Uh, hind is a, is a female deer. And referenced many times uh, throughout scripture. And in talking about her, it says he, he's able, they make spiritual progress. Remember that part of that scripture? Make spiritual progress and not stand still in terror. Well, you picture that hind on that, that jagged mountaintop. I wish we had pictures. That jagged mountaintop and that deer that, that literally bounds from from little place to little place and when they leap when I read about them uh when I I guess the males do it too but they talk about in particular about the females when they leap like that they're when they land their 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 front two feet when they leap their back feet hit the exact same spot does that make sense like when they're leaping their front two feet hit and as they're going their back feet hit the same spot within an inch they said it it's amazing if God can design an animal to flee and to stand and to flourish on a mountaintop that is jagged and not his regular terrain, how much more can you and I abide in safety and hope and praise in the difficult places of our lives? He has designed our course, our course each and every one of us, and he knows exactly how to keep our feet from falling. Amen. That hind that jumps, it's amazing. Um, most everyone likes to make progress on their job, with their marriage, with their family. We are growing and learning and developing every single day, but the most important progress we can make is spiritually. And nine times out of ten, we are like a hind standing on the side of a cliff, hard places, uh, very few easy ones anymore, right? Jagged edges, not much, not much footing, but he makes our feet like hind's feet able to easily move in places like that, rugged and tricky spiritual terrain. We can leap and jump like a heart with him guiding our steps. Psalm 18, 36, thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip, making progress, not standing still in terror. Uh, James 4 and 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's action on our part, not allowing the devil to get the upper hand, submitting to God. These are all things we must steadily do uh, while surrounded on every side by jagged edges and what looks like impassable odds. But God, he makes my feet like hind's feet. Psalm 18, 33, he maketh my feet like hind's feet and setteth me upon my high places. I'll end with this. I'm thankful for spiritual detours, aren't you? I'm thankful that someone who possesses more knowledge and more understanding than I will ever attain is willing to take the time to steer me and guide me in paths that keep me safe 
and keep me from areas I do not need to pass through. I am glad God orchestrates my life and directs my path, orders my steps, but I am equally as glad that he allows us the choice to detour the hard places ourselves. He gives us the ability to encourage others and steer away from the things that fight to overwhelm us. He welcomes us to a place of peace because, after all, that's the place he chooses to inhabit. I want to encourage you to continue to continually be on your detour today. From whatever whatever you're facing, your permission has been given. Let's let's go on a praise-filled detour today and lift him up and honor him throughout this service. I love each of you. My goal is heaven. I want us to all go together. Let's worship the Lord together today. Love y'all. Pharisees called him a devil Cause they brushed their doctrines aside And soldiers called him the king of the Jews And they mocked him as he hung and died Pilate called him an innocent man Tried to wash blood off his hands But the crowd called aloud And they say you crucify that man But I called him father, father, friend, friend. The beginning and the end I called him a constant, a companion
welcome to South Asheboro Church of God morning worship service. So good to see you in God's house. Just let go and let God have his way today. Yes. Praise God. Uh, I slipped and I forgot to write down. Has anybody had a birthday since last Sunday? Any birthdays? Anybody have a birthday? Wedding anniversary since last Sunday? Okay. All right, we'll have the $2 drawing for our children. Uh, while the Chris is coming up, uh, I got a card. Uh, this is to our South Asheboro Church of God family. We want to thank everyone again for all your support and giving. Thank you again for gifts and money. We also appreciate everyone who brought food to us. Most importantly, thank you for all the prayers. We are so blessed to be part of this church family. Brother Scott, Sister Ashley, and Lily Jean. Praise God. Praise God. We're blessed to have uh, Lily Jean with us. Uh, you know, our church is growing. And so they're doing their part, so you've got to be doing y'all's part. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, we've got a lot to pray about this morning. Let's uh, continue to pray for Brother Marvin Cox. He's recovering from pneumonia. Pray for him. Also, pray for our youth. Our youth, uh, they're being attacked more and more today than ever. Uh, and, and our nation. Pray for our nation. Our nation needs to turn back to God. Also, uh, continue praying for uh, Brother Ball. He's, uh, he has a heart doctor appointment Tuesday, and he's having the veins in the neck check Wednesday. Pray for a good report that he can have that uh, hip surgery because he needs to have that replaced because it's taking a, a toll on his hip that he's already had replaced. So pray for him. Also, pray for the backsliders. You know, the backsliders, uh, you know, we know who they are. The ones who have been here, they were saved. They've gotten back out. Uh, but pray for them that God will bring them back in. Uh, pray for Brother Benny's back. Uh, he's having a problem with his back this morning. He t- heard him tell Brother uh, uh, Matthew this morning, he said, take care of your body while you're young, son, because you get older, you'll wish you had. Also, pr- continue praying for Brother Baker, Sister Sharon, all the si- all of Sister Jane's family. Lift them up in prayer. Continue praying for Sister Lois. Uh, you know, she's grieving the loss of her son, so pray for her. Has anybody else got a prayer request? Pray for Tiffany, uh, needs salvation and healing. Also, Sister Blanche got some unspoken requests. Also, I want our pastor to come. We're going to anoint his arm. He asked for us to anoint his arm. You know, when James, the fifth chapter, said, if any afflict, he said, let them pray. And he goes on and said, if anybody's sick, said, let them call for the elders of the church, and anoint them with oil, and pray the prayer of faith. You know, it's their uh, job to ask for the, you know, the elders to come. It's the elders' job to have the faith for the healing. So as we have Pastor come up, we'll go ahead and we'll have our Holy Ghost filled brother and come up and let's pray for the Pastor. Yeah, pray. We love you, brother. Get some Holy Ghost filled brother and come up and we'll pray for the Pastor. Right on.
Sunday school lesson this morning. You know, we yes. we can take detours, you know, for God. We don't make any detours for the world. But I thank God that He's He knows where we're at and He helps us when we're having those times. We're having sorrows. You know, we take those detours sometimes. But God helps us. And uh, what I want to talk to speak on today is bringing forth fruit and flourishing, and it kind of goes along with the lesson. Psalms 92 tw- verses 12 through 14 said, "The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree." He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still be bringing, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. So what I got to say to that scripture is, elders, it's not time to retire, it's time to refire. And to the youth, those are younger than the elders, it's uh, time uh, for to be planted in the house of the Lord that you may flourish. So let's, the elders, it's time for us to refire. We don't have, we can't retire. We haven't made it home yet. So let us refire. And that's what the church needs today. It needs the fire that it had in the past. And God's not, you know, he's not changed. So that tells me it's us. It's me. I look in the mirror, it's me. I've got to make sure I'm refired. So Lord, help me today. Praise God. Let's continue to worship as the choir comes this time ministering song. Praise God.
have that little talk with Jesus. You know, when I was talking about a while ago about getting refired, a lot of times to get refired, that you have that little talk with Jesus. The first thing you need to say is, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for my slackfulness, the way I've been slackful in my reading and my praying, whatever I, my witnessing. You know, forgive me. A lot of times that little prayer with Jesus can start off with that, and you can see that fire starting to burn. Praise God. Let's continue to worship and give and get our ushers coming at this time to receive our offering. We're going to receive our. Uh, uh, off, or worship offering, and then we're going to come right behind it and do our widow's offering today. Today is the uh, first Sunday of the month. Brother Matthew, would you pray over this time of worship? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bless you for your giving today. This time we'll have Sister Amy, Sister Harris, and Sister Brady come and minister in song. Praise God. Lord bless you.
Sister Amy is teaching about you know, the detours. We don't know what life's going to give us, what detours going to be, but we know through it all that we can trust in God. He's going to bring us through every situation. Praise God. This time I'll turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Praise the Lord. Give God a hand of praise today. Praise God. Praise God. I'm glad that God is a faithful God. Can you shout Amen. You know, I was thinking this morning, if you, the longer you live, the more you're going to deal with, the more we're going to face in this life. We were talking before the service of uh, how many people seem like, Brother Auburn, I believe what said, that seem like now most of the time you spend buying flowers, going to funerals, loved ones are passing away, people leaving this world, there's sickness all around us, this world's in turmoil, this country's in a mess. Yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. We have to stay full of the joy of the Lord. We have to keep ourselves joyful. Sometimes you have to make yourself be joyful. But Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord is my strength. Some of the worst places in our life is when God's doing the greatest work. We get down and discouraged. We get depressed. We get oppressed. But some of those times is when God is doing the finest work in us for his glory. When Jesus was on that cross, Jesus is the only person ever walked on the face of this earth who said, who the Bible said, who did no sin. He did not commit sin. He's the only one that could ever say that. Yet hanging on that cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was all alone there, he felt like. God the Father turned his back on his own son. Jesus had done no wrong, committed no sin, but yet he found himself in that place where he felt abandoned by his Father. But did you realize that it was on that cross that God was doing the greatest work that he would ever do? It was while Jesus was hanging on that cross, suffering like that, that God was doing his finest work. Sometimes we're in those places that God is doing his greatest work in our lives. 
is when we feel like God's abandoned us. The Father has forsaken us. Three days later, Jesus was rise from the grave. You and I are here saved today because of that. So if you're going through a hard place right now, yet rejoice in the Lord, the God of your salvation. Keep your joy about you. Amen. God's doing a great work. It's amazing. I was thinking this morning. I do a lot of thinking. I was thinking this morning sometimes, be careful of the voices you listen to. Be careful what you give ear to. People will pull you down, discourage you. Find you somebody like Barnabas who's an encourager. Somebody that'll lift you up when the way's hard, when things are tough. I thought about, you know, there's some folks like Job's friends. When Job was going through sickness, dealing with all he, everything he lost, his friends came to him and said, you're a sinner. That's why this is happening to you. But did you ever stop to think, maybe God's doing a work in me right now? Did you ever stop to think, maybe God's trying to carve out something here for his glory? And that when things get better, when things change, he's going to get magnified and glorified for it? I was praying for some of you last night in my prayer time, my prayer closet. Some of you dealing with things. And I told the Lord, I said, I'm going to go ahead and praise you right now for their healing. I know they're not healed yet, but I'm going to praise you for it right now. I know some are dealing with things right now that it ha hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to praise you for it right now because I know you're working right now and you said that all things are working together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I thought about Moses standing before that Red Sea. They murmured and complained until they got safely to the other side. Then they started banging the timbrels. Then they started shouting. Then they started worshiping. I said, God, I'm going to worship you on this side before the Red Sea's ever parted because I know you're going to work miracles. I know you still got the power to part the Red Seas. Can you shout amen? Those same ones like Job's friend who's always pointing the finger saying you're going through this because you're a sinner because you don't love God. When they go through it, it's not because of that. When they go through it, it's because God's doing a work in me. But when you go through it, it's because you're a sinner. I believe I'd stop my ears to that and open up my ears to this word again. Trust in God. Can you shout it? Well, I feel like running around this building a little while here this morning. We have to keep the joy of the Lord in our lives. Through it all, he's faithful. Can you shout amen? Well, I wish I could hug everybody's neck this morning. You're a beautiful looking congregation. I'd get Sister Shelton to hug the ladies necks and I'd hug the men's neck and we'd all be happy. Amen. We're glad that you're in God's house. What a beautiful day to serve the Lord. I thought I had messed up. I saw Brother Benny come in. I thought, sure as the world, he's preaching here this morning because he makes me look bad today. And I concur with him 110%. If you're a young person, you better take care of the body God's given you. I told my father-in-law they ought to do a class at school to teach you about taking care of yourself while you're young because if you live to get old, you're going to pay for it down the road. Don't try to do more than you can do while you're young. Do something because laziness will kill you. Do something, but don't hurt yourself. Take care of your body while you're young. Say amen, old people. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Praise God. Hallelujah. Good to see Dale and Diane back with us. I love them. Their family here. We love you and appreciate all of you. I love, love to see people in God's house on Sundays. It's a joy to be here. Amen. Enjoyed all the teaching this morning, the singing. It's blessed my heart today. I've just been sitting up here just taking it in, just taking it in. Just makes your heart swell, don't it? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, begin reading in verse 17 this morning. I won't preach a long time today. I'm going to preach till God say through it, we're through, and then come to the altars and let's pray. The Apostle Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 
For the preaching, the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Sinners think we're crazy. They think we've lost our minds because of the way we live. This book is a crazy book if you're not a Christian and you don't have Christ living in your life. The world thinks this is nonsense. This is foolishness. He said, for the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I'm thankful for the cross of Jesus. The preaching of the cross, the message of the cross. The sinner says it's nonsense, it's foolishness, it's fairy tales and fables. But to us who have come by that cross, we've been saved by the blood of Jesus. It is the power of God. Can you raise your hands and thank Him and praise Him this morning? Hallelujah. Oh God. My, my, my. Feel God in this house today. Praise the Lord. You can be seated for a little while this morning. Brother Dean, give me a little bit more on the monitor and just kind of watch me when I move, brother. Amen. I want to talk to you for just a little while on this thought, what the cross means for mankind. What the cross means for mankind. The Bible tells us that it was the cross, this emblem of shame, Bible said, Cursed is that man that hangeth on a tree. It was an emblem of shame that God chose for the royal standard of the church. Do you realize there's possibly never existed a word more universally known than that of the cross of Jesus Christ? It is the center of history, and without it, history would be incomplete. All history since the death of Christ is dated from that cross. When a letter is written and a date is placed on that letter, we are silently witnessing to the existence of the cross of Christ because time is reckoned from Calvary. Don't you love it every time an atheist writes a letter and puts a date on that letter and they are silently witnessing to the existence of the cross of Jesus Christ. They won't admit that, but that's what they're doing. We know today that the cross is the center of Christianity. When you look throughout God's blessed word, this holy book, this blessed book, we can find the shadow of the cross that fills every page of the word of God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we find the first mention of that blessed cross as it gave hope to a fallen Adam. Up to that point, mankind had sinned and fallen away from God and had been cut off and separated from God because of their sins. But it was there that God made mention of the cross of Jesus Christ. He said in Genesis 3 and 15, He said, And I will put enmity between these, speaking of that serpent, the devil and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it or he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Hear God speaking of the cross of Jesus Christ. We're hanging on that cross, that serpent, the devil, would bruise the heel of the Son of God, but yet the Son of God would crush his head as he hung there and died for lost mankind. And then we're looking at Exodus and Leviticus. We see the offerings and the sacrifices. They're all shadows of the offering and the sacrifice of the cross. In the book of Numbers, according to the command of God, you remember how that Israel sinned against God and they murmured and complained and how God sent fiery serpents in their camp to bite them. And those that were bitten, they would die. But God told Moses to make a serpent of brass and hanging on a pole there, and all those that had been bitten by those serpents, they could come and look upon that serpent of brass high upon that pole, and they would be healed. 
Then Jesus himself in the New Testament, uh, he spoke of that serpent of brass being lifted up. Uh, and those who would look upon it would find healing. He said in John 3 and verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, uh, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, I'm telling you that that serpent in the wilderness raised upon that pole, uh, and those that looked upon it found healing and found life. Uh, it was a shadow and a type uh, of the cross of Jesus Christ. Can you shout amen? amen? It pointed ahead in time to when men, mankind who had been bitten, by the curse of sin, those who were dying in trespasses and sin, they could look upon Jesus Christ who had been high and lifted up upon that cross and everyone that looked upon him, they could be healed, they could be saved, they could be delivered, they could be rescued, they could find life and life more abundantly. I thought about my own life when I was living in sin, the time that I was bound up in sin. I had that poison of sin coursing through my veins. But on a Sunday night in that old building over there, I came to Jesus Christ and I looked upon the Son of God. I can't tell you what happened other than if you've experienced it for yourself. But on that night, Jesus came into my heart. He saved my soul. He healed my soul. And he gave me life evermore. Gave me eternal life. I'm just telling you, friend, uh, there's still power in the cross of Jesus Christ uh, to heal and to save uh, to the uttermost. Can somebody give him praise here today? <coughs> Amen. Mankind is living with the poison of sin coursing through their veins. If you're here today and you've got that poison in your life, if you're living bound by sin, if that devil's got a hold of you, uh, the only way you're going to escape is the cross of Jesus. Got to come before that cross. Got to bow down before him. Got to confess your sins that I'm a sinner. I, I need a savior. I need a redeemer. I, I need a healer. Got to come to that place where you say, I, I don't want to live like this anymore. I, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I, I need healing in my life. I, I need forgiveness. And if you repent of those sins, Jesus Christ is just to forgive us of our sins and to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. I'm just telling you here today that the ground is level at the cross and there's room for you at the cross of Jesus Christ. Raise your hands and give him praise and glory. Thank God for the Christ that hung on the cross. The types and the shadows of the law. They speak of the cross of Christ. The prophets of old, they foretell it. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, he plays the chorus of the cross on his harp. Those evangelists in the New Testament, that they went out preaching the message at. They stated the facts of the cross and revealed uh, all of its benefits to a sinful uh, and a lost mankind. They told the disciples, uh, they said, we don't care if you leave here. But if you do, don't you preach Jesus. Uh, don't speak of him anymore. They went right back out uh, and they preached the message of the cross. Uh, they told of how Jesus came, uh, how he was born of a virgin, uh, how that God sent his son, uh, his only begotten son into this world uh, to die on that old rugged cross. Uh, they preached the message uh, of how he sacrificed himself, uh, how he cried out is finished uh, and he gave up the ghost and he died. Uh, they preached the message of how uh, he was buried in a borrowed tomb and for three days his body lay there lifeless but on that third day he arose again he said I've got the power to lay my life down and I've got the power to take it up again no man takes my life but he gave it freely and he rose again on the third day and he said behold all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth that was the message 
message of those evangelists. And if you come to Jesus, his atoning work on that cross, you can be forgiven of your sins. You can be saved. And you can know eternal life. Hallelujah to God. Throughout the word of God, throughout this blessed book, the cross of Jesus Christ is woven through its pages and it is the theme of this holy book. The cross is the center of Christianity because without the cross there is no Christianity. Without that atoning sacrifice on that cross there would be no forgiveness of our sins. There would be no salvation. There would be no reconciliation to God. Without the cross of Christ, you and I would still be lost in our sins today. You and I would still be on our way to hell. Amen. I thought about the funeral we just had here, the home-going service, the home-going celebration of Sister Jane. Without the cross of Jesus Christ, it would have been a time of mourning. It would have been a time where we wept uncontrollably because there would be no hope of her being healed over there. There'd be no hope of her having a brand new body. We were talking about it this morning. Soon and very soon, we we're going to get brand new bodies. We're going to be with King Jesus. I thought, my God, it was a celebration because of what Jesus did on that cross over 2,000 years ago. What a mighty God that we serve that gave everything that you and I could be saved. Without the cross, there is no Christianity. Without the cross, there is no hope for mankind. Romans 3 and 25 said, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The apostle Paul said in Colossians 1, 20 through 22, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that is you and I, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, hallelujah, in his body of his flesh through death uh, to present you, to present the church uh, holy and unblameable uh, and unreprovable in his sight. Uh, I'm telling you without the Christ on that cross uh, and the cross of Jesus Christ, uh, there is no hope for humanity. Uh, there is no forgiveness for sins. Uh, there's no hope for you and I today. Uh, but because of Jesus hanging on that cross uh, and taking my place uh, and taking your place. Uh, now we can sing the song that the angels cannot, cannot sing. Uh, I've been redeemed uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Say amen to him today. The Bible tells us that when Moses and Elijah met with Christ on that mount of transfiguration, the topic of their conversation, it was the cross because they realized that all the glory of heaven for humanity depended on the cross. In order for God to accomplish his redemption for lost humanity, Jesus had to go to that cross. He had to suffer and he had to die. The Bible said that he suffered outside the gate and that he set his face like a flint for he was determined to die. Even in that Garden of Eden, uh, there when he prayed until his sweat became uh, as great drops of blood. The Bible said on three occasions he went in that garden. Uh, he prayed, went back to his disciples, uh, and they were fast asleep. And he woke them up and said, pray. Uh, he went back and prayed a second time and the third time. Uh, and again, they were fast asleep. Uh, and he said, sleep on now. But he warned them. Uh, he said, the flesh, the spirit's willing, uh, but the flesh is 
is weak. He prayed until his sweat became as great drops of blood. And this is what he prayed. He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I'm so glad, Brother Benny, that he went to that cross. I'm glad that he hung there in shame. I'm glad that he suffered like he did. I'm glad that he died and he rose again. I'm glad now because of that atoning death and that sacrifice. Now we can have life and have life more abundantly. And we have the hope of eternal life when we leave this world. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Lift up your hands and love him this morning. Hallelujah to God. Oh my God. <laughs> I wish I could sing it. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. Oh God. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. That word hallelujah means praise the Lord. It is the universal language of praise. Whether you're in Africa, whether you're in China, whether you're in Jamaica, whether you're in the United States, it is all the same word, hallelujah. It means praise the Lord. I tell you, church, he's worthy of our praise for the sacrifice that he made, for his death for you and I, that he took our place. He paid a debt that I owed, a debt I could not pay, but he paid it all because he loves us and he cares for us and because of him we are saved we're forgiven we are redeemed hallelujah to God my God Jesus had to go to the cross in order for God's redemptive plan to be accomplished but I'm so glad that he said, not my will, nevertheless your will to be done. The cross is the center of Christianity. I, I, get, I get tickled sometimes. Now I watch folks who adorn themselves with a necklace with a cross on it. The cross is more than gold hanging around your neck, sir. I get amused sometimes at how even at Easter time we try to make the cross, uh, you know, uh, something sweet and lovely and a wonderful aroma and sweet smelling. I'm telling you the cross was a place of death. It was a place of dying. It was a place of sacrifice. They tell me that under that those temple sacrifices, the institution of those sacrifices, uh, they said that you could smell the death uh, before you ever arrived at the temple. Uh, the cross was a place of shame uh, and humiliation. Uh, it was a bloody place. Uh, but yet Christ uh, suffered on that cross for you, uh, young and old alike. Uh, he did it because he loved us. Uh, the Bible said in John 3, 16, uh, for God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son uh, that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish uh, but should have everlasting life. Uh, I want to say this to you today sir. Uh, I'd say it to you ma'am. Uh, if you're lost, uh, if you're in sin uh, the cross, uh, that man hanging on that cross uh, he's the only hope that you have uh, but he is your hope. Hallelujah to God. He is your hope today. The cross is the center of Christianity because it is the only cure for sin. The cross is the only place, the only way that sin can be put away. Hallelujah. It's the only remedy for the sins of humanity. Before the cross, you know, the law was given and the law revealed sin and the law condemned men. 
The Apostle Paul said, if I had not known the law, then I would not have known sin because the law revealed sin. He said in Romans 7 and 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay. I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. The law revealed sin and the law condemned men in their sins. But what the law could not do is provide a remedy for those sins. That's why Jesus came. The law, he didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law. He came to do what the law couldn't do. The law could tell you that you were wrong. The law could condemn you, but it couldn't save you. There was no remedy in that, but Jesus came to be the fulfillment. He came to redeem mankind. The cross of Christ not only reveals and intensifies sin, it is the only remedy for the sin of mankind. This makes the cross the only grounds for salvation today. I'm telling you, friend, it is the power of his blood that was shed on the old rugged cross that delivers us from the penalty and the power of sin. For that you ought to shout amen. For that you ought to say praise the Lord. It is because of the cross we can be redeemed. We can find remedy for for our sinful condition. Hallelujah, Hallelujah to God. He up. <laughs> the law condemns. Paul said the law was not wrong. Because until the law said thou shalt not lust. Paul said I didn't know it was wrong to lust. But the law could not save. The law could not redeem. But Jesus came and fulfilled that law. In John chapter 8. I love the story in John chapter 8. Jesus there at the temple. And those church people. God help us not to be those church people. They found a woman taken in adultery. And they drug her like she was and threw her at the feet of Jesus. And the law said that she is to be stoned until she's dead. Those religious people didn't care about her. You can't have Christ in your heart and not have compassion for sinners. You hate the sin, but you love the sinner. They didn't care about her. They didn't even care about the law. Because the law said both parties were to be stoned to death. They didn't even bring the man. They didn't care about that woman. They threw that woman, that degraded, shameful, sinful woman, at the feet of Jesus. And they said the law said she is to be stoned till she's not breathing, till life leaves her. What do you say? And Jesus kneeled down and began to write in the sand. And he stood up and he said, let one, let one of you that's without sin go ahead and take those stones and throw them at this sinful woman. And again he kneeled down and began to write in the sand again. And the Bible said from the eldest on they dropped the stones and they all walked away. And when Jesus arose again the only thing before him was that pitiful degraded, shameful, sin-cursed woman. And Jesus said, woman where aren't thine accusers? <laughs> and she looked around and she said, there are none, Lord. Some of the greatest words in the word of God. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Don't go practice that no more. Go and sin no more. How is it? Sister Audrey, Jesus can say, neither do I condemn thee. The law said she's to die. That was the law. The law said she's caught in adultery. She's to be stoned until the life has left her. How could he say to her, 
I don't condemn you either. You remember when I told you? He come to fulfill the law. Because Jesus knew in just a few short days. Hallelujah. He's going to carry that cross to Gog. And in just a few short days, they're going to drive those spikes through his hands. They're going to drive those spikes through his feet. Just a few short days, he's going to hang on that cross. And he's going to die for that woman caught in the act of adultery. He's going to take her place. That's why he could say, I don't condemn you either. Because he's going to die for her. He's going to be the sacrifice for her. The law said somebody's got to die. And he said, I'll do it. Just like it took Barabbas' place. Just like it took your place. Just like it took my place. I'm telling you, friend, I'm thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. I should should have died in my sins. But he said, I don't condemn you. I'll die for you. I got more. Stand, raise your hands, please. I got a lot more, but I got to stop right here. Raise your hands. I love Jesus today. I see your condition today. I know the sin that's in your heart. You have not hid it from me, for I have eyes to see. I love you. You're the reason I sent my son to die. You're the reason the price was paid. I sent my son as a sacrifice for you and the sin in your heart. If you'll come to me today, if you'll look upon my son who I gave to you, I will save you. I will cleanse you. I'll remove that sin from your heart and from your life. Don't run from me. Don't reject me. Don't resist me. I sent my son for you. And I will save you, saith the Lord. Put your hands in love, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what a Savior. Sister Albright, do we know that song? Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. Let's play something about Jesus, please. I was bound in my sin. Don't ever give up on anybody lost in sin. Don't ever give up on anybody lost in sin. Don't ever think they've gone too far. Don't ever think they've been this way too long. Because God sent His Son to die for them. Don't ever, don't ever think you've gone too far. Don't ever think it's too late for you. (laughs) I said, don't ever think it's too late for you. God loves you. God sent His Son to die for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Let's continue to worship Him today. If you're here and you're lost this morning, I want you to come to these altars. Not because I've asked you to, but because the Lord has called you, the Lord has dealt with your heart. If 
if you're lost. We were all, every one of us were that lady in John chapter 8. We were all that way. Maybe you didn't commit adultery. Maybe you didn't. But we were all guilty. We were all guilty. Did you realize that if that woman obeyed the Lord, we don't hear anything else about her in Scripture. When Jesus said, go and sin no more, that what he meant was don't go practice that anymore. Don't go practice that life. Don't go practice sin anymore. Did you realize that if she obeyed him, she's in heaven? The rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, Good master, teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what are the commands? What do the commandments say? He said, I've done these from my youth up. Been raised in church. Tried to live by those, those commands. Jesus, knowing he was rich, it's not wrong to have riches, but it's rich, wrong for riches to have you and his riches had him. How do you know his riches had him? Because he's going to prove it. Jesus, knowing he was rich, knowing that had his heart, he loved his money. He said, take that you have, get rid of it, give it to the poor, come follow me. The Bible said that he turned and went away sorrowfully for he had many riches. As far as we know, he's in hell. Jesus never chased him down. Jesus never said, come back, we'll, we'll make some changes for you. But to those who would repent, he forgave and he gave life. You don't have to leave this service like that rich young ruler today. You don't have to leave here sorrowful, wishing I'd gone to the altar, wishing I'd made right with Jesus, wishing I'd come to the Lord. But you can leave here rejoicing that I'm saved, I'm healed. The poison of sin's gone. Not what I used to be, but I am but what I am by God's grace. Would you come? Would you come? If you're lost, if you're a backslider, if you if you need Jesus, I'm gonna wait just a minute while she's playing. Would you come this morning? Would you come and know Him? Would you come and know Him? If you're here today and you've got lost family members desperately need salvation desperately need Jesus would you come build you an altar and call their names out to him if you're lost these altars are open for you you can be saved today you can be changed today you end up like Brother Eddie crying you can't stop tears of joy and happiness Brother Eddie told me before he got saved he didn't cry since he got saved he can't quit crying (laughs) that's not tears of sadness and sorrow but tears of joy heart is filled with the love of God Let's pray for the lost today.
Brother and Sister Albright sing that song so well. If just one more soul were to walk down the aisle. It'd be worth every struggle, be worth every mile. Jesus, I thank you this morning. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the plan of redemption. That through you we might be saved. I pray over this, this beautiful congregation today, Lord. I thank you for these precious people. They are precious. We all have a soul. We all have a soul. We're going to spend eternity somewhere. I pray, Lord, don't let anybody leave this service this morning without you lost and undone. Save to the uttermost. Convict. Draw us to yourself, Lord. Send healing today. Tradition says at the cross there was a hunchback there, a man that was bowed over. And when the water mixed with blood came from the side of Jesus, when they took the spear in his side, his ribs, make sure he was dead. Tradition says that that blood and water mixed from his body splashed on that hunchback, that man that was bowed over. Tradition says that he was healed instantly. Some of the writers come out from under disciples wrote that that he was healed at that cross that day. There's healing at that cross spiritually. There's healing at that cross physically, emotionally, mentally. At the cross, this earth, this world, humanity received the greatest gift known to mankind. A priceless gift. It is the pearl of great price. The value of it is greater than any riches of this life, this world. To be saved, to know Jesus.